I grew up in a small town on the southern edge of Missouri. It wasn't a very large town by any means, but it had everything one would need to survive. A post office, a drugstore, a handful of shops, a grocery store, and even a small movie theater. A lot of people would probably hate to live in a small town, but I didn't mind it. I had a few friends and I knew almost everyone who lived there by name. My father worked in the post office, and my mother worked from home. She was a technical consultant for some corporation out of state. If I had to describe my town with one word, that word would be simple. Nothing of any significance ever happened in my town. The most notable things that I can remember is one year my neighbor had his trash can stolen by what we all assumed was a bear though it has yet to be recovered. Another year, a lady who lives just up the road from us won the lottery, a whopping $1,200. She was really the talk of the town for a few weeks. But, four years ago, something strange happened to my town and everyone I've spoken to since couldn't seem to remember it. Once I turned 21 years old, my parents did something incredibly unexpected. They gave me their house. The house itself was just your average run-of-the-mill home. Nothing fancy. My parents had paid off the majority over the years, and once I finished college and had a steady job, they asked me if I'd be willing to take over the payments. My parents had been talking about retiring to Florida for years, and once I was finally able to live within my means, they made the offer. I was ecstatic to say the least. While the thought of spending more of my life in this town disappointed me somewhat, the thought of being a homeowner at such a young age was exciting. My dad told me that if I wanted to sell the house that I could, though the thought hadn't even crossed my mind. During that year, I helped my family pack up most of their belongings and they headed to their new home in the retirement capital of the U.S. The first few weeks were amazing. I loved the freedom of doing whatever I wanted in my new home. After the first month, however, the sudden realization of bills hit me like a ton of bricks. Even though most of it had been paid off, the utilities as well as any additional expenditures quickly piled on. Adjusting to living on my own definitely needed some getting used to. I had to pick up extra hours at my job just to get by. One night, after getting home late from work, I lazily stumbled through my front door and fell face first onto my couch. I turned on the television so I could have a little bit of background noise while I drifted off. Only, what I heard on the TV captured my attention. A local news announcer said that a strange storm was heading in the direction of our town. He didn't say what type of storm it was, only that we should all remain indoors and that we shouldn't attempt to go outside regardless of what we see. I thought that was an odd way to describe a storm, but I thought nothing of it and drifted off to sleep. When I awoke, there was darkness. The alarm I had set my phone to go off at 8 a.m. rang violently in my pocket. I sat up and noticed that my windows looked like they had a black sheet hung on the outside of it. Inside my house was almost as dark, but I could still make out the vague shapes of my furniture. I walked over to my window and stared out of it, unable to make anything out aside from the dirty glass that I was looking through. I tried to call my boss to see if he was experiencing the same thing, since I had to be at work in an hour. When I called him, I was greeted with an endless busy signal. I grabbed my jacket and made my way to the door. I'm not sure why, but when I grabbed the handle, something in the pit of my stomach told me not to open it. So I didn't. I sat back down on my couch and tried the TV hoping that there was some more information on this strange phenomenon. I wasn't so lucky. My TV only produced static, which seemed to struggle as it tried to light up the living room. I waited for a few hours, and the darkness only persisted. 
It was around the sixth hour mark that I began to hear things coming from outside. Muffled screams in the distance. People crying out for help before quickly going silent. I wasn't sure what I should do. Then, I heard someone right on the other side of my window shouting for someone to come help them. I made my way over to the glass hoping to see something, but it was useless. While I was pressing my face against the glass in my attempts to see anything, something slammed against the window causing me to fall backwards. I'm not sure what hit the window as I still couldn't see anything on the other side. I scrambled to my bedroom and locked the door behind me. I tried dialing the police but was once again met with a busy tone. A few more hours passed and I tried to keep my sanity by reading a book with the use of one of my desk lamps pressed closely to the pages. I was just trying my best to wait it out, hoping it was just like any other storm and would soon pass. Then, I heard a knock on my door. My back door. I got up from my desk with a baseball bat in hand and slowly crept over to my door. The closer I got, the louder the knocks became until I was face to face with the door itself. The knocking stopped. I called out, asking if anyone was there. No one responded. I then called out that I had a gun and was willing to use it, even though that was a lie. Still no response. After waiting for a few moments, I decided that I had gone insane and was now hearing strange noises. As soon as I turned my back to the door, the knocking turned to pounding. This sent me into a sprint back to my bedroom, slamming and locking the door once again behind me. I huddled myself in the corner of my room with my bat in hand, and though I tried to stay awake and on guard, my tiredness got the better of me. I awoke on the floor of my bedroom with the bat still clutched in one hand, only this time, light was now shining through my window. That's what had woken me up in the first place. I rapidly sat up and the first thing I did was check my phone. A new day had arrived and I had somehow slept for 12 hours. I checked all the local news sites but what I saw confused me. There were no mentions of anything out of the ordinary for the previous day. I scrolled and scrolled, but nothing had been posted. I called my boss to ask him about yesterday, and he was upset that I just skipped an entire day of work without letting anyone know. I walked outside my house and looked around. My entire neighborhood looked just as normal and boring as it always had. I was starting to think that I must have just imagined all of it. That was until I walked around to the back of my house. My entire back door was completely scratched up. Long gashes ran along the wood almost as if a wild animal had been scraping away at it. The fact that it was still standing was beyond me. Over the next few days, I started to notice other small things wrong with the town, which ultimately led to me selling the house and moving out of state. A few of my neighbors' houses had recently become vacant. I remember each and every person who lived in those houses, but whenever I ask someone about it, I'm always told they had always been empty. I tried searching for the missing people in phone books and online, but their names never pop up anywhere in the whole state. After that, I sold the house and moved to a more populated town in Illinois. Over the years, I have just tried to forget about the strange incident that occurred four years ago. I'm not sure where that darkness came from, or what was lurking within it. I have no idea where my neighbors disappeared to, nor why nobody seems to remember it happening. The only reason I'm bringing it up once again is that I just turned on the TV, and an announcer is saying a strange storm is moving into our area soon, and that we should all stay indoors. So if any of you out there happen to see the same broadcast, get out of town before you end up like one of the people that everyone else forgot.
I don't know exactly what led up to it. To me being transported to that world of literal smoke and shadows. I just remember sitting on the bus, wishing the traffic would let up so I could just get home. That's it. Just a regular, normal, everyday bus ride. I don't know if I said something or did something or sat somewhere that I shouldn't have to trigger it. I just know that I was on the transit way heading home one second, then I was gone the next. I can vaguely recall seeing finger-like tendrils of smoke billowing in from the windows moments before my world was enveloped in white fog stretching as far as the eye can see. The seat I was sitting on disappeared beneath me, and I fell onto solid ground. My body felt strange, like my insides were drenched in static, or like that prickly feeling you get when you fall asleep on your arm, but without the numbness. I thought, I hoped, I had just dozed off on the bus and was dreaming, but everything felt so real. There was a smell to the air, a breeze, pain from the fall, and this incessant low drum putting pressure in my ears. It didn't feel like any dream. It just looked like one. I pushed myself to my feet and took a few tentative steps. The gravity here was wrong. I felt weightless like being in the water, but without the thickness of liquid slowing my movements. My body practically fluttered through the atmosphere, yet I was still tethered to the ground. Everything about this place was wrong. I had no idea what to do. There's no tutorial on what to do if you suddenly get transported to a world of fog. Obviously, someone needs to write one. My first thought was... I'm dead. My bus had gotten jackknifed, and we had fallen into a ditch, and I must have died. And this was the afterlife. No god, no devil, just thick fog, gusts of air, and a whole lot of nothing. Just when I thought I had come to terms with my reality, or, you know, fallen into the throes of shock, I guess, I saw something in my peripheral vision. I whipped my head and caught sight of a shadow passing by, like a silhouette standing behind frosted glass. Desperate to see who it was, I ran after it, but the shadow never became tangible. It was like chasing a rainbow. It looked real, like you could catch it, but it was always out of reach. I slowed to a stop, only to have another shadow pass right by in front of my nose. These things weren't solid. They were made of smoke. Great. I glanced around and saw more of them. Big ones, small ones. It was strange, because their silhouettes weren't so blurry that I couldn't make out distinctive features. I could see horns, lumps, snouts, all tied to shadows that stood and walked like humans. Another creature walked by, this one as tall as a building. I found myself frozen with fear, hoping that it wouldn't see me. It had a tail. Two tails. Something was whipping around behind him. His arms were long, and his knuckles dragged on the ground like an ape. He could have crushed me if he could have touched me. As he passed, that... those tails... sliced through me and I felt nothing but momentary increase in the static. Suddenly, I wasn't quite as worried anymore. I mean, don't get me wrong, I was still completely freaked out, but at least I wasn't in danger. In the near distance, a thick tendril of smoke slithered along the ground like a snake in the grass. It was so long, I couldn't see where the shape ended. It was denser than the other shadows, but I didn't think much of it. At least, not until the shadow of a centaur-like creature trotted by, and the tendril struck it. It wrapped itself around its hind leg, tugged, and the smoky centaur became not so smoky anymore. The impact of its fall lifted the fog around it, giving it weight. I was wrong. It wasn't a centaur. 
It was more like an anthropomorphic goat with a strong, muscular, humanoid torso covered in a thick black mane that fed into a sleek, nimble-looking goat's body with all four legs. The goatar thrashed, bawling and squealing as it tried to break free, but the tendril held firm. I tried to run, but like you can't get closer to a rainbow, I couldn't get farther from the goat or the tendril. Or hell, I don't know. Maybe I was just running in place. With the odd gravity and the lack of points of reference, I honestly couldn't tell you whether I had moved at all from my initial starting point. I closed my eyes and wished I was home. Then, I heard a terrible roar that shook the ground. I opened my eyes, only to see what the source of the tendril was. It was coming from a tower of thick black smoke with six stones hovering just outside of the blackness. No, not stones, eyes, four glimmering purple eyes, two half-moon eyes that blinked at different intervals. The half-moons were locked upon me, but the other two were on the gotar. The tower of smoke became a mound, and the mound began to waffle side to side, as though being pulled in different directions. It was trying to decide whether to eat me first or save me for dessert. I don't think I've ever felt more powerless in my life. The logical thing to do was run, but running did nothing. I was just exhausting myself. The four purple eyes aligned at the top of the mound, and a spherical shape stretched out to meet them. The circle was still attached to the mound by a thin neck that spooled out as needed. The second head appeared. This one to stretch out to the pair of half-moon eyes gazing at me. The head with the other two eyes whipped down at the gotar, two tendrils shooting out to join it. They held the gotar down as the disembodied eyes seared their way into the gotar's sockets. The creature bucked and screamed in pain. I could hear the sizzle as its eyes melted and were replaced with the purple ones. I was shaking, sweating, the goat creature let out a final whine, and then it stopped moving. The purple eyes now burned into it blinked, and suddenly the goat's body began to crack like an old painting. Pieces of it flaked away until only a thick black blob-like shadow remained, with purple eyes attached to where its head had been. It stood and trotted into the mound of smoke adding to its massive volume. The two eyes returned and all four turned onto me. Oh no. A tendril whipped towards me and I tried to run, but like I said before, there was nowhere to run. It caught me by the wrist. The head with the half-moon eyes slowly stretched towards me, and its eyes detached. They floated closer and closer to me, aligning with my sockets. I thought I was a goner. I legitimately thought that I was going to die even in the goddamn afterlife. But then, the strangest thing happened. A crow, a random crow swooped in out of nowhere and pecked at the eyes. The six-eyed shadowed freak roared so loud the ground shook. Its half-moon-eyed head snapped back like a yo-yo and the tendril holding me released its grip. Movement drew my eyes overhead where the silhouettes of birds circled around. There were hundreds of them, and as I watched, they broke from their shadowy forms and became tangible. They flew towards the creature, cawing and scratching. The mound of smoke retracted back into a pillar, and the eyes whipped around frantically. My vision was a mess of birds and feathers flying through the air. I squinted and tried to see what was happening. But then... I felt a hand on my chest, a hand that made the staticky feeling retreat. I squinted and saw a man with black hair and bright golden eyes staring back at me. He shoved me hard and I fell back. I felt like falling down a well. I could see the smoky world disappearing around me through an ever shrinking hole as I fell deeper and deeper. Suddenly. I landed in the middle of the bus aisle, as though I had lost my balance when the bus driver hit the brakes. 
Everyone was looking at me, and to them, I must have looked pretty weird. You know, disproportionately freaked out about falling on the bus. Someone helped me back up, and I guess I must have been shaky, because someone else gave me their seat. I rode home, reeling from what had happened. It's morning now, and I'm still reeling. Like I said at the start, I have no idea what caused this. I think that's what scares me the most. I don't know how or why it happened, and I'm not sure how I can keep it from happening again. I work as a security guard for the happiest place on earth, Disney World. Typically, I wouldn't say where I work as obviously there are some pretty strict rules about things employees can put online, but I just don't think I could tell this properly without the context. And honestly, I think that this may be it for me anyways with this job. I just can't see myself working here any longer now. I've been with the company for 23 years. The first 20 years I worked in the parks, nabbing shoplifters and rounding up people who were drinking too much to combat the heat. Occasionally there'd be a fight to break up, but people usually kept it pretty mild. The heat and the walking was getting too much for me over the last few years, so I asked to be transferred somewhere with air conditioning and the company moved me to one of their resorts. While the working conditions were 110% better as far as climate and comfort go, the guest issues were definitely trickier, mainly domestic. I guess the expense and stress of vacation got to a lot of people, and I'd be called by neighboring rooms because some mom and dad were yelling at each other all night. I'd try to suggest they take a nap or go do separate activities for a bit, and that would usually calm them down. But none of that is what I'm here for. I've got to get this out while I still have time. Three days ago, I got a call from management. Apparently, a couple of days before that, housekeeping had gone into a room that should have been turned over for that day. Turned over is when one guest leaves at about 11 a.m. and the next guest checks in at around 3 p.m. And all of the guest's items were still in the room. Housekeeping made a note of it and moved on. But during the next two days when they entered the room again, everything was still there and untouched. I went to check it out and sure enough, there was an empty room full of luggage, clothes, snacks, some toys, everything a family would need for a vacation. The manager had already looked up the previous reservation and it was for a family, dad, mom, two little children. I tried to call the phone numbers they had given, but all I got was voicemail. We were all a bit stumped, so I made the call that the housekeeper could clean the room and take the family's personal items to be held until we got in contact with someone. I went digging into the reservation a bit more. The family had arrived five days before housekeeping discovered all their stuff. I found that the family had paid a parking fee and their vehicle description was listed. A quick walkthrough of the parking lots and I had easily located their vehicle. So that ruled out a car accident or them deciding just to leave all their stuff behind. Next, I saw that they had bought a dining plan. This is when a guest prepays for all their food. They're given a certain number of credits to use for meals. This family had only used three credits and the last one was two days after they checked in. It appeared that the day they arrived, they got here pretty late, and probably just stayed on the resort. The next day, they used two credits at Epcot. The second park day, they used just one credit at Magic Kingdom, and it was at breakfast time. Now, at Disney, we have something called Magic Bands. Magic Bands are worn by the guests and act as a room key, park ticket, credit card, dining reservation payment, fast pass a system used to bypass lines, and more. It took some work, but I was finally able to look up the family's fast pass history. The day they went to Magic Kingdom, they had breakfast at a restaurant in the park, rode a few rides, and then rode their last ride. It's a small world, 
around 11 a.m. Then nothing. Finally, it was time to bring in someone else on this. I called an old co-worker at Magic Kingdom and asked him to pull the security footage for It's a Small World at the time they wrote it, and I made my way over there. When I arrived, my friend was very confused, almost distraught looking. He showed me what he found. There's usually a camera in the direction of where the rides load and unload. The footage showed them scanning their bands to use fast passes for the ride and boarding it. The footage from the exit of the ride, however, just showed the other people in their car exiting. That family wasn't there. Of course, we all thought the worst. Maybe one of the kids had fallen out and mom and dad and the other kid got off in the middle of the ride to help, and they're all injured or killed or stuck in the machinery somewhere. So we shut down the ride, middle of the damn day, turned off that earworm music and turned up the lights. My buddy and I walked that ride three times before we called in help. Eventually, there was close to ten cast members searching, and we didn't find a damn thing except for three cell phones and a hat. I was completely baffled. I've kept digging over the past couple of days, and I'm not sure who to tell what I found next. I've called the police, and I suppose they're on their way. But the company has a way of covering up things like this. And I decided I can't live with myself if I don't put out some type of warning. I kept digging into their reservations over the last couple of days, and today I noticed that they had purchased Memory Maker. There are photographers all over the parks and cameras in a lot of the rides. And with Memory Maker, the photos are all free. They automatically get added to a guest's Disney account when the system knows their picture has been taken. And the system always knows. Everyone's whereabouts are always known with the magic bands. Well, I opened up their Memory Maker photo album and I swear to God, there's 732 pictures. The first 30 or so are pretty normal. Epcot, a few rides in front of the castle. But the rest... The rest are all in It's a Small World. The rides only take one picture per go-around. So it appears as though this family has ridden this ride over 700 times. The first picture was pretty normal. Everyone looked happy. It was a busy day, and a full car of guests. The next one is rough to look at. The car is empty except for this family, and they look so confused. The next 10 to 15, I can see the dad getting angry and yelling. The mother is holding onto those two kids like her life depended on it. And you can see the kids getting increasingly upset and crying. And it goes on. And on. And on. After 50 or so, it looks like they're trying to get out. But in the very next one, they're all right back in that damn car. After around 4.50 or so, I only see the mom and kids. It's just when I look closely, I can see the dad. Maybe just his body now. Slumped down in one of the other seats. Since about 675... There's just mom and one kid. Another body in another seat. The mom and child aren't moving anymore. I think the two of them are still alive. Just damn near catatonic. Looking straight ahead. With pale faces. And guys. I swear to God on my life. The dolls of the ride are moving or something. In some of these pictures, I can tell they aren't where they should be. I even saw one with a doll in the car with the family. I can't look anymore or I think I'm going to be sick. I closed the album. Its file size has increased since I closed it. Oh my god. Are there new pictures being added? I noticed on the security cameras that the local police department just arrived, so they'll take over soon. I just wish I knew what the hell was going on. But I also wish this damn thing had never landed in my lap. I don't think I'll be able to update this. 
After I talk to the police, I think I'm just going to walk out of here and never come back. I just wanted to get this out there before Disney feeds the media some BS cover-up as to why the whole family vanished. But they didn't vanish. I know exactly where they are. So let me give you a little background before I dive into this nightmare that I'm currently living. A couple years ago, I got into urban exploration. A few buddies and I would explore the Twin Cities area for anything and everything abandoned. The sketchier, the better. Gray Cloud Island, old breweries, rundown factories, you name it. Drain tunnels beneath the cities and old farmhouses even. I loved seeing the way time reaches its fingers around creation after man had left. It was a fun weekend hobby, despite a run-in or two with some squatters. After a while, I began running a blog with photographs and details about my adventures. It got a pretty sizable following. It wasn't long before I received an email from what appeared to be a small monthly magazine that wanted me to do a section on urban exploration. They gave me a phone number and asked me to call them, as they said they'd love to use my work. They offered to negotiate a price for my exploration, too. The magazine was called Gatherings. Seemed legitimate enough, even though I had never heard of them. The magazine seemed to revolve around travel, I think, but there didn't seem to be any overall theme to it. Loving the idea of getting paid to do my hobby, I gave them a call. Hello? I said. There was nothing for a few seconds before a lady responded. Gatherings Magazine, how may I help you? I told them why I had called and she responded. Oh, perfect. We'd love to have you run an urbex section on our page. All you'd have to do is find one or two spots a month. With that, we'd want lots of photos of the spot itself and the surrounding area. Details of the place and either an address or location of the spot. On top of that, feel free to write about your own personal experience at the spot. I asked them if they wanted a specific type of building or farmhouses, etc. The woman said, Anything. It could be an old factory or a small house in a suburb, as long as it's been abandoned for a while. All right. Seemed pretty cool, I thought. I didn't know how I felt about giving out so many details about spots I had found, since that's a prime way to get a spot noticed and closed off for good. What's your offer for a rate? I asked. She promptly replied, 5000 per location. Jesus, there's no way she was serious. Excuse me? I replied. Just send us the location and you'll receive your payment in the mail for each location. She stated, why the hell not, I thought. I'm in, I said. Wonderful. Whenever you're ready, just send in your first spot and you'll be receiving your first check shortly after that. She hung up immediately after saying that. Well, now it was up to me to find a spot. Record the details. Take some photos and send it all in. The next weekend, I went to a small farmhouse I had found before, but I never blogged about it. A sort of hidden gem among locations. I'm not going to give out very many details here, but it was somewhere several miles north of White Bear Lake, down a long, winding dirt road. I arrived there later in the evening before the sun had set, took the photos, recorded the exact location of the place, and jotted down some descriptions of the location itself. How many windows it had, the color of the house itself, if it had a basement, the amount of rooms, etc. I sent all the information in via email and I didn't receive a reply. To be honest, I was kind of disappointed, figuring I probably fell for some sort of scam. However, a few days later, I went to check my mail and I found an envelope with the Gathering's logo on it. I opened it, and there it was. Five grand in cash. I'm pretty sure my heart skipped a beat when I saw that cash. A small note inside the envelope read, Thank you for your submission. 
We were grateful to receive it. This gift is the first of many in our partnership. With regards, Gatherings Magazine. I immediately planned my next trip. I was going to hit some tunnels under Minneapolis that I blogged about before, however this time a bit more extensively. I did the same thing, photos, locations, details, and sent them all in. A few days later in the mail I received an envelope with my cash. This time there was a different note however which read, Thank you for your submission. However, we would like to clarify that you are under no circumstances to submit to us any locations which you have previously made public. We apologize for not clarifying this earlier. With regards, Gatherings Magazine. Well, that was odd, I thought. I guess they want originality, to be the first ones to write about these locations. The note had a weird, hostile vibe to it, and lacked the watermark that the other note had. Well, either way, I still got my money and I planned on getting more. I needed to find some new spots quickly. Every weekend I was out searching, the farther out of my way I had to go. Luckily, I was compensated for my extended travels. I also noted that the more remote the location, the more money I was paid as well. But the money generally stayed between five and 8000 per location. This went on for a few months before I decided I needed to take a break. I emailed them letting them know I was going to slow down a little for a few months. They seemed to have no issues with it. About a month after that, a buddy of mine wanted to get into my little hobby. No one at this point knew I was making any money doing these explorations. So I decided to take him to that little farmhouse for my very first submission as sort of a exhibition. I knew I couldn't send them a location I had already been to before, so I just went back for the fun of it. We went out on a Saturday morning together. We parked a short ways down the dirt road and walked the rest of the way to the farmhouse. The farmhouse itself appears small from the outside, and its paint was worn to a dingy brown. It's actually quite hard to spot if you're not actually looking for it. Inside the house is empty aside for a cellar door which leads to a quite sizable basement. In the basement, there are a few doors and some old wooden tables. When I was down there before, I saw that all the doors just led to empty closets. As we passed by the barn, the first thing my friend noticed was an odd smell. After he mentioned it, I began to detect it as well. It smelled like a mixture of burnt hair and skunk. Or maybe it was just the dankest weed on the planet. I guess this could be a pretty cool smoke spot if it weren't so sketchy. At the entrance of the farmhouse was, well, a skunk. However, it looked as if it had been disemboweled by some pissed off animal. It seemed to be old too, like it had been there for a few weeks. It reeked. I poked it aside with a stick and we entered the house. The smell grew stronger inside. We both turned to one another and he asked me if it had smelled like this the last time. God no, I replied. We walked around for a bit, going into the rooms one by one. In one of the rooms we found some action figures sitting on a windowsill. They were pretty retro but still kind of cool. However, I didn't really remember them from last time. We then decided to enter the cellar. We opened the door and entered the unlit area. I fished my flashlight out of my backpack. I turned it on and most of the cellar lit up. What I saw made me step back. Blood was smeared across every wall in the cellar. Flies buzzed to and fro across the room in a disturbing, continuous hum. There were drawings on the floor, with odd shapes and numerals. Melted candle wax stained the ground. In the center of the room was what appeared to be bloody bits of flesh coagulating into the ground. The smell punched me in the face like a heavyweight boxer, almost causing me to collapse. In my disorientation, instead of running back the way I came out, I accidentally ran to one of the storage doors, but it was locked. Panicking, I gripped the doorknob and struggled against it. Finally, something clicked, and I felt the door knock me backwards. I fell back on my ass as I watched what had to be four or five bodies plunged out from the closet. I just stared for a moment, no doubt in shock. 
I remember they were all adult bodies, save for one, clearly a child. There was one who fell forward almost completely on top of me. His chest was opened up, cut from the neck just to above his pelvis. It almost looked like a surgical cut in contrast to the blood and viscera strewn about the room. I gathered myself and noticed that my friend had already ran out of the room. I scrambled to my feet and ran outside, gasping for air. He just stared at me in horrific confusion before he said, What the hell, man? We didn't really speak to each other for the rest of the day. I don't know if he thought I did that to him on purpose or as a prank, but he was visibly shaken. Hell, I was too. At first, I was hesitant to call the police. What the hell are they going to think about me being there? The only guy who knew about the location. So I decided to leave an anonymous tip after my friend and I had already left. A week passed after that incident, and I received a new letter in the mail. This one read, We respectfully ask that under no circumstances do you ever return to any of the locations you have submitted to us. We apologize for the inconvenience. The police have been spotted. I think I'm done submitting any more locations. I'm going to take the money I earned, move out of the city, and not look back. If any of you out there are into urban exploration, be very careful out there. You never know what you might find, or who might be watching you. I work at a cemetery, Pine Lawn Memorial Park to be exact. My family has owned it for nearly five generations, and I've been working there since I was 12, officially since I was 15. Cemeteries, I know, are sort of inherently creepy, and despite my family being in the dead people business since long before I was born, I still have always found it to be a weird place and for much, much more than the obvious reasons. I wrote a few stories related to Pine Lawn in the past, but I decided to put them into a more concise format, as well as add several more details. Growing up, I heard stories aplenty of weird things that happened at the family cemetery. One thing I had always been told is that even though weird things happened, no one that's ever worked there has ever been harmed. Other people are a different story, I guess. I suppose I should begin with the very first one I ever heard, from my mother. Some weird stuff had happened before this, I guess, but since it was the first story I had ever been told about Pine Lawn, this is what made me weary to ever be there by myself or at night. Something like 100 some odd years ago, the cemetery was obviously much smaller than it is now. At the time, there were around 120 bodies buried there. Apparently, the city wanted to develop, and they wanted to buy the particular land that my family owned, effectively shutting us down. My family fought it, and a deal was reached to sell them the land we had if the city would also pay a portion of the land next to it, on which my family could continue the business. The city acquiesced, and they partially paid for an equal amount of adjacent land, my family, at the time, also bought several more acres past that, which we are still filling up to this day. Anyways, when that happened, my family had to inform all the other families that the remains of their dearly departed loved ones were going to be moved to a new plot. Work began, and as bulldozers and other large shoveling equipment wasn't yet common, it all had to be done by hand. Everything went well for the first roughly two-thirds of the moves, the ground was dug up, the caskets were retrieved, and they were all moved, along with their headstones, down to the new, freshly dug plots. The final third is where things got weird. Back then, caskets were generally made of wood, and rather than crafty woodwork designs made, a decorative cloth was laid over it. These wooden caskets, more often than not, weighed roughly equal to or less than the body they contained. All this is to say that in many cases, the weight of the body inside was discernible from the casket itself. Well, when they got to that final, northernmost third of the land that the city had bought, 
The caskets became lighter. The sounds of corpses within. Slight sliding, a jerky step making a limb fall to one side. Jostling the inside of the box, etc. Began to become fewer and farther between. Eventually, with the last 20 or so caskets, they felt like there was nothing inside at all. With the permission of the families, the cemetery employees opened these caskets they thought were empty and found just that to be the case. The insides of the caskets were bare and looked as if there hadn't been anything inside them at all. This was quite a bit of a scandal as I'm sure you can imagine. My family, both publicly and privately, swore up and down that the land had been untouched since the caskets in question were buried and that the absence of any contents as well as the cleanliness of the caskets themselves, was simply impossible. It took quite a few years for the reputation of Pine Lawn to recover, but eventually it did. My grandfather worked at Pine Lawn starting in the 60s, but lived there his whole life. The house that my family built on the property, the one I actually live in now, has been passed down from generation to generation. It is about 30 yards back from the main office, his room was on the second floor, facing the cemetery itself. By then, some 40 years after the missing body incident, the cemetery had grown quite a bit alongside the town itself, with several hundred burial plots. Just before the plots begin, there is a thin concrete walkway about 20 feet from the main office, leading from the road that goes through all the different sections. Back then, it wasn't split up into sections, but there was a main road around the area of the plots. On either side of that walkway, there are two huge trees and a lamppost. One night when they were kids, my grandpa and uncle were up late. My uncle happened to look out their window and swore to my grandpa that he had seen someone walk up behind one of the trees. The lamppost illuminated the very first handful of plots and headstones on the other side of the road, but at that point, they were undisturbed. My grandpa and uncle stood at their window for a little while with my grandpa ultimately teasing my uncle for being scared. However, when they woke up the next morning, the police were in the cemetery. In the hours between when they looked out of the windows and saw the burial plots undisturbed at around 4 a.m., and the time they noticed the commotion at about 7 a.m., seven of the plots had been dug up. The headstones were stacked very deliberately, like a house of cards, and behind them, the caskets were atop one another. The first one lying flat on its side. The next one standing straight up vertically. Then another one on top of that one flat. Then straight up, then flat, then straight up. With the basic casket dimensions taken into account, that's nearly 30 feet high. I'm sure you can imagine, even with machinery in the present day, that would take at least a little bit of time to accomplish. But no, back in the 50s, this was somehow done in a span of less than 180 minutes, with no one that lived in the house able to hear anything going on. I suppose I should tell you all one of my own. Obviously, as time has gone by, improvements and additions to the cemetery have been made, namely the crematorium. I've had a number of odd experiences with our crematorium, which was built on as an extension of the main office. One such instance was in 2012, following a funeral for a very large man, roughly 375 pounds. I got the retort, the cremation chamber, preheated while my wife, but at the time girlfriend, Kimmy, set up a movie to watch while the body was being cremated. She was nice enough to wait for me. I used the elevating platform and then slid the body in, closing the door to the retort afterwards and going to sit down. About five minutes after I had shut the door to the retort, while Kimmy and I were beginning to watch the movie, we heard a noise. Neither of us paid it much mind, but a few moments later there was another one, and then another. I stood up, worried that the man may have had a pacemaker still in his body, however unlikely as he had all of his organs removed. As we got up and walked over to the retort, the noises got more hurried. We looked through the front window of the retort and couldn't believe what we were seeing. The body inside was flailing about. Both of the deceased's arms and legs were bouncing around like he was in extreme pain. 
Now, it isn't odd to see body parts move while the body is being cremated. As the limbs are broken down, they will often contract as muscles and tendons snap. But this was most decidedly not that. I went around to the side of the retort, where we have three longer windows that give us a profile view of the body. The dead man's fingers were balled up into fists and were banging against the windows, and his legs seemed to be kicking downward as if trying to get out. As I watched from the side, the man's mouth opened, and first, groans began emanating from within, then screams. The man had been confirmed dead nearly 80 hours prior. There was no way, absolutely no way whatsoever that he could have still been alive. His organs had been removed for God's sake, but for about 20 seconds after we had gone up to the retort, the corpse inside the cremation chamber screamed and flailed his arms and legs about, as if he were being burned alive. Then he simply stopped. Kimmy and I were both in shock. Neither of us said anything for a few minutes, and when I was finally able to find the words, I advised her not to ever mention it again. It was an anomaly, air escaping from the lungs, an excess of strained muscles and tendons snapping. I said whatever I could to justify it enough to move past it. Even so, it's something that never left our minds. Another quick one was actually just last year. The addition to the main office that contains the cremation chamber naturally has an exhaust. I was sleeping one night late November when Kimmy shook me awake. I asked her what was wrong and she told me to look at the office. I got up and walked over to the window and saw that from the exhaust there was a thick plume of smoke coming out of it, as if a body were being cremated. Seeing as we're the ones who operate the crematorium and neither of us were down there, this obviously should not have been happening. I had Kimmy call the police while I went over to check on things. A fire of over a thousand degrees was likely burning inside. One way or another it had to be turned off as quickly as possible, at the very least controlled. All the lights were off and the doors were locked, as they were every night. I went inside, and inside of the retort was bright with flames, but there was nothing inside of it. We meticulously cleaned the cremation chamber after each use, and while the flames alone would likely produce some kind of smoke, the smoke that we saw coming from the exhaust was the kind of thick, gray and black smoke that could only be produced by something actually physically burning. I shut it off and went around to check the windows and the postern doors, which were all intact and locked. There is a ladder that leads to a ceiling exit, but that too was locked from the inside. The police showed up and took a report, but there was really nothing to be done. It was attributed to someone having left the retort on before leaving, even though Kimmy and I both knew that the other hadn't done that. That's one I'll ponder forever. I have many, many more stories, both from my own experience, namely the mausoleums, Halloween nights, and the grass being cut, and instances passed down from my family from years ago. I'll work on typing up those stories, and I'll try my best to post them as soon as I can. The problem with asking yourself if you're insane is that you're the only one who can answer it. And why would you listen to someone who could be crazy? I must have asked myself a hundred times over the last week. It started with little things. I spent almost an hour looking for my stapler before finding it in the break room fridge at work. I work at a software company. Boring stuff. I'd get the wrong day for a staff meeting or have the wrong information for a client and accidentally ask him about his wife, who had been dead for over a year. My shoelaces never seem to be tied, although I don't suppose it matters, because somehow my shoes were also two sizes too small. The worst was when I couldn't even recognize someone at work. She swore we've known each other for years. Apparently, I went to her kid's piano recital last month, I wish she had just gotten angry at me instead of giving me that despairing, pitying look. 
I think I gave my sick cat that same look right before I had to put her down a few years ago. What could I do, though? The woman was just a tired face and a tight ponytail to me. I still couldn't pick her from a police lineup or remember her name if my life depended on it. These only account for a handful of my slips. Any one of them might be forgivable in isolation, but the daily repetition left me anxious all the time. I couldn't even trust myself to remember the route to work that I've been driving for the last seven years, obsessively using my GPS just to be sure. Every thought, every move, I was doubting myself, hating myself for double-checking things with twice the self-loathing when I didn't and slipped up. That's when it hit me. Every unaccountable thing that was happening to me was around work. Chances are, anything bad that happens at work is because of that son of a bitch who still thinks his eyebrow piercing is cool at 40, Jason Britton. I don't know how he's doing it, but he is. Hell, he probably even hired that lady to screw with me. I haven't seen her since our altercation the other day. He's the only other person who has been working here over five years, and with our district manager talking about retirement, my only reasonable competition for the position. I caught his eye. He was staring at me over his coffee, not even pretending to hide his smirk when he put down the cup. I grinned back for once, acknowledging the silent battle which has already begun. Check your email? He asked me. No, why? Did you sign me up for another pornographic newsletter? Any jury who saw that smirk would immediately forgive whatever I did to him. Manager wants to see us about something tomorrow morning before work. Just us. That'll be enough time, I said, casually leaning back in my chair. Enough time for what? Suddenly, the spine of my chair broke in two. Screw the jarring impact as I landed on the ground. It was my dignity that was hurt more. Jason howled with laughter as I scrambled to my feet. The chair hadn't snapped at all. It had been unscrewed. Enough time to break him. His plan was obvious enough. He wanted me so rattled and insecure that I made a fool of myself right in front of the manager. Then he'd swoop in all suave, smothering me with fake concern as he brought up my recent mistakes. It wasn't a terrible plan, if I'm being honest. But there's something he didn't account for. He spent all this effort trying to make me seem crazy without realizing that I'm already insane. He seemed on edge after that, glancing at me every few minutes, waiting for me to make my move. Good. Let him wait. Let him stew in that uncertain fear that he made me suffer through. Let him jump at every noise and go out of his way to avoid every shadow. He won't be ready for what I have in store. By the end of the hour, Jason was fidgeting nonstop. I don't like this, he said. Let's call a truce, okay? There's a better way. I raised my index finger in the air, making him wait a few more excruciating seconds before replying. The time is nigh. What? Nobody talks like that. Say it one more time for the recorder, please. He held up his phone. Red light flashing. I just smiled and looked directly into the light. You think I care about some crappy desk job? The day of reckoning is coming in June. And you'll pay for what you've done. Perfect, he said, swiftly concealing his phone. The manager is going to love this. That should have been his victory, but he looks more pallid than ever. That was too easy, and he knows it. I heard him replaying the recording a dozen times by the end of the day, staring at disbelief how crazy I actually looked. You all probably think I'm crazy too, don't you? You've all gotten so used to the status quo that you've forgotten how fragile it really is. A fancy title like manager, or police captain or even president. You think it all still means something, don't you? And everything that doesn't fit into your imaginary idea of how the world should be, 
You just throw it away and pretend it doesn't exist. If you feel safe right now, you're a complete joke. At least Jason was smart enough to realize how screwed he really is. Look, man, I'm sorry, okay? It was just a prank. No point in putting up pretenses anymore. I didn't even touch my computer. I just sat there staring at him, humming, watching the sweat bead on his brow. They're jokes. Remember when you took your shoes off when we met those telecom people at that fancy Japanese place? I swapped them for a smaller pair I brought. <laughs> jokes, get it? Funny jokes. I just smiled. I get it, Jason. Ha, ha. I didn't laugh. I just spoke the syllables slowly and deliberately. Then I went back to humming. Tomorrow morning is going to be... Fun. Jason still showed up for the meeting the next morning, right on time. I guess I had overestimated him. I held the door for him to enter, but he pushed past me anyway. You're probably wondering what this is all about. Don't worry, you're not in trouble. Mr. Dawson, the salt and pepper haired manager, has a calm voice. Jason has been fidgeting with his phone since he came in but I think he's starting to relax. He even spares me a glance. He thinks he's safe now, that I wouldn't dare do anything right in front of the boss. Oh, poor Jason. I gave him the look that I gave my old cat. He quickly averted his gaze. The truth is that the rumors are all true. I barely recognize my grandkids every time I see them. They're growing up so fast. And I think it's time I step down as district manager. I started to hum softly. I don't think the boss noticed, but it was satisfying to see how rigid Jason's posture became. Before you continue, there's something you should know, Jason blurted out. He sounded shocked to hear himself speak. This isn't how he had planned it, but now it was too late to turn back. There have been reports all over the office of this guy's erratic behavior, and I don't think he'd be right for the position. Look, I even got a video. Jason practically slams his phone on the desk, immediately hitting play. The screaming shatters the early morning air. The agony was palpable. The shaking video darts back and forth across an overcrowded classroom with a concrete floor and barred windows. What is this nonsense? Mr. Dawson demanded. I'm sorry, I don't know how this got on here. Jason stammered. I hum a little louder. I think it's something by Beethoven. Jason snatches for his phone, but the manager is quicker. He scoops it off the desk and holds it in plain view. Where is this? Who are these children? I don't know, it's, it's nothing. What I was trying to show you is, that's Jake. Oh my god. The boss had paused the video on the impassioned face of a screaming child. What the hell are you doing with my grandkids? I guess we'll have to play the video to find out, sir. I supply helpfully. Wait, stop! Give it to me! Jason dives across the desk to take his phone. But Mr. Dawson roughly shoves him back into his seat. His hand trembling. He hits play again. The screaming is eviscerating. The camera shakes as the person holding it moves. It stops in the center of the classroom, looking down at a child with a shaved head. Gender unknown. The child keeps its gaze directly forward, breath rapid and shallow, not looking into the camera. Casey, the manager whispers, barely able to breathe. Say it one more time for the recorder. It's Jason's voice, that I had also recorded the day before. The boss couldn't tell that it was an edited video, but Jason could. He glared at me and I silently mouthed the words, Ha ha, jokes. Get it? Funny jokes. There's a better way, the child says, still staring rigidly ahead. A metal plate is dropped unceremoniously on the desk. I'm not sure if the others recognized what was on it, 
but I could tell you that it was a raw human liver. The child lunges for it, to clutch it protectively in both hands as though afraid it will be taken away. The kid sinks their teeth into it, the blood oozing between their fingers smearing across their face. The manager is going to love this, Jason says again. Then the recording ends. Stunned silence. There's murder in Mr. Dawson's eyes. I don't know if this is a bad time, sir. I pipe up. But I don't think either of us should have the job. Jason's obviously a sick wacko, and... I actually have another opportunity coming up. That I wouldn't miss... For the world... It's been referred to as the worst turbulence ever. The flight seemed to be progressing as usual when all of a sudden we heard the captain frantically shout over the PA system. Would everyone please return to your seats and buckle your... But then, the plane started shaking uncontrollably. I thankfully had my seatbelt on, but those that didn't were thrown around the plane. I remember seeing a dozen or so people rise in the air and smash into the ceiling before being aggressively pulled back to the floor. None of them were seriously hurt, just a few strains, bruises, and breaks here and there, but it was still terrifying to be a part of. If you Google Flight 759, you'll be able to read about this flight all over the internet. But those articles don't tell you the entire story. It was worse than just the shaking and the bruises. It was something else. Something strange. Looking out of the plane's window was like looking at light dispersing through a prism. The glow and sound surrounding the plane were like something not part of this world. While seeing people smash into the ceiling of the plane and while trying to avoid loose items crashing into everyone around me, there was also somehow a sense of tranquility. The other passengers around me saw the lights and heard the sounds too and seemed just as confused as I did. When the turbulence, lights, and sound all came to a pinnacle, the strangest thing of all happened. Time seemed to almost stop for me. I couldn't hear anything at all and all the bright lights dissipated. But the passengers, all of them, were motionless and they were staring at me. It was unsettling to say the least. The man sitting right beside me was staring at me right in the eyes, expressionless. I looked all around the plane. Every single passenger was turned to look at me. The employees as well. Even those who moments ago were clutching at strains and brakes and screaming in pain. All of them, now silent motionless, staring at me. It lasted half a minute max. It ended with one last flash of bright lights, and then all at once, the cacophony returned. Panic, yelling, the pilot spoke again through the PA system and apologized. The flight attendants were rushing through the aisles trying to help the injured passengers. The man sitting beside me asked me, did, uh, something strange happen to you during the turbulence? I just shook my head. I didn't want to talk about what had happened. But I looked around the cabin and saw that most of the passengers looked uncomfortable, as though something far stranger than just the turbulence had happened to them as well. That was my first hint that what all of us had just experienced on that flight was far stranger than what any of us could have ever imagined. When we landed at the airport, I noticed that I had received a text message. It was from Lorraine, my ex-girlfriend. Have you landed yet? I'll wait up for you at home. I can't even begin to tell you how strange it was to read that text. I can admit it right now that it scared me. Terrified me. Things had ended between us months ago. I'm not willing to go into the specifics of what happened at the moment but it just seemed impossible that she was at my house. 
I must have stared at the text for five straight minutes, short of breath. She couldn't really be waiting for me back at the house, could she? I thought long and hard about what I should do next. Part of me wanted to turn right around and get on another flight, leave town, never come back. But that's not what I did. I was too curious. I got in a taxi and headed back to my house. We arrived and I handed cash to the taxi driver. But then it happened all over again. Just like in the plane. I heard the rumbling sound again and saw some flashing lights. And the taxi driver was staring at me, like the passengers on the plane. He was motionless and expressionless for a moment. But then, he spoke to me. Things got mixed up, he said. It was monotone, robotic, unearthly. You need to fix it. What do you mean? I replied. But then everything went back to normal. His voice was clear and everything else around was silent. I said, do you want change? He repeated to me. No, that's fine, I told him. I snuck quietly up to my house waiting to look inside. Would she actually be there? As I approached the house, I saw that the living room light was on. And then I saw her. It was really her. She was sitting in the living room watching TV. She was actually there. I approached the door and she looked up and saw me. She smiled. She actually smiled at me. And that's when I fully realized. It's not that she had somehow come back to me, no. In this world where I was right now, I had never lost her in the first place. Had that flight taken me to an alternate reality? Was I in another dimension? I had no idea. But she was there, in my house, waiting for me. I opened the door. Her smile was so big. She was so happy to see me. How it could possibly be, I don't know, but it was true. She was there, and she was happy to see me. She hugged me gave me a kiss on the cheek, and asked me how my trip was. I should have handled it better, but I couldn't. It was too much. I broke down in her arms. I gripped her hard as though I didn't really believe she was real, and I began to sob. Whoa, did you really miss me that much? She asked. Yes, I said between sobs. I really did. I really, really did. And things went right back to how they used to be. Everything was great between us again. I forgot that I had ever been this happy. That I ever could be this happy. But not everything in my life was so perfect. There were still some strange things. Like, for example, there was a beanbag chair in our living room that I simply didn't recognize. And also a striped sweater in my closet. Neither of them are me at all. I have no idea why they were there. I asked her where she got both of them, but she just looked at me like I was crazy. I didn't buy either of those, she told me, partly laughing. You already had them when I first moved in. And then, to make matters worse, the sounds and lights returned last night. I woke up to them. I looked at Lorraine to see if she heard them as well, but she was still silently sleeping. Beautifully. She's so beautiful. I approached my bedroom window and looked out. I was entirely unprepared for what I was about to look at. I can see about a dozen houses through the bedroom window. And in every one of those houses I saw the silhouettes of my neighbors staring at me through their windows. Motionlessly. In some houses the lights were on and I could see them clearly. In others it was pitch black and I could just barely make out their silhouettes. But they were all there, staring. There was a man standing in the middle of the street, looking up at me just like the others. He eerily waved for me to come outside. I know it seemed risky and unnecessary, but I wanted to have some answers, so I decided to go out and see him. He stared at me blankly when I approached him. And then he spoke. He sounded just like the taxi driver. 
things are mixed up. Yeah, that's what you said to me before, I thought to myself. Fix it. What are you talking about? I asked, but he just ignored me. He said nothing at all. I went in my house and grabbed the beanbag chair and striped sweater. I brought them outside and set them on fire. Is this what you want? I shouted at the man. The silhouettes were all still in their window staring at me. Look, they're gone, all right? Still expressionless and robotic, my neighbor spoke one last time. There's still more. Fix it. And then I realized what I needed to do. I went inside and slammed the front door shut. I went to the bedroom and looked at her. And I began to cry. And now I'm writing this out. I suppose those of you reading this think I need to break up with her all over again. To set things right. I guess worlds collided with each other on Flight 759. Things got mixed up, as they keep telling me, and I need to make things normal again. A beanbag chair, a striped sweater, the things caught in between, and my girlfriend, who I'm no longer supposed to be with. I needed to make things right by breaking up with her. But that's not how I lost her, you see. It feels like a different person who did this all those months ago. That night, we were at my parents' house for the holiday. I knew I shouldn't have been driving. I was tired. But I wanted to make it home early. She asked me if I was fine. I thought I was. When I told her I was alright, she looked skeptical, but still she agreed. I saw the trust in her eyes. I've seen them every night since. But I had lost control. I hit a patch of black ice. The car flipped. Her head smashed into the passenger side window. The window cut a large gash down her neck. I saw the blood dripping everywhere. She didn't even scream. She couldn't scream. She tried to hold her hand up to her neck. To stop the bleeding. But then, she looked at me. The bleeding wouldn't stop. Her eyes looked through me. And then, she died, in agony, with fear in her eyes. I had lost her, and I'm not sure if I can lose her again. I know what I need to do, but I'll never be able to do it. I don't know what problems that will cause. I just looked out the window, and they're all still staring at me, waiting because I'm not going to fix it. I won't fix it. I can't. It took an entire full day to realize my little brother had gone missing. Growing up, he was always a quiet kid. He barely had any presence in any situation. He was never picked on in school for being quiet, nor was he treated any differently than the other kids when people paid attention to him. But that was just it. People rarely noticed him. During the time in which this event occurred, he was only 10 years old while I was only a couple years older. Even though we were roughly the same age, my parents entrusted his welfare solely to me. I'll admit, at first, I absolutely hated it. Whenever my brother would get into trouble or break something, or generally have any type of problem, I would end up paying for it. The very first instance of this was when he broke his television. I was in the other room playing on my Nintendo that my parents had bought for me. My father was at work and my mother was busy cleaning our house. Suddenly, without warning, a loud crash resonated from my brother's room. My mother went rushing in there and found that he had somehow turned his television completely around and it fell off his dresser. After checking to make sure he was alright, she came barging into my room to yell at me for not keeping an eye on him. I was confused by this as I hadn't previously been told to babysit him before. My mother's response was, You're old enough to have responsibilities. Your brother is now one of them. 
After that, I tried my best to keep a close watch on him. We went to the same school, and that made things quite a bit easier on me. I didn't have to constantly be around him all the time guarding him. Mostly, it was just when we would walk to and from school together. The walk to school was a long one. It would sometimes take us a half hour just to make it there. My family only had one car, and my father used it for work every day. And once my brother and I were semi-competent as far as children go, we walked to school on our own. In hindsight, that probably wasn't very smart on my parents' part, but we didn't know any better. The school wasn't very far from our house, geographically speaking. If we walked directly to school, it would probably take us five to ten minutes tops. However, there was a large forest surrounding the outskirts of the school, between my house and the school itself. My parents forbade us ever to step foot in that forest. The way my parents warned us about those woods was somewhat strange. It didn't just seem like they were worried about poison ivy or simply getting lost. It seemed like there was something else. Regardless, the route that we had to take around the entire forest increased our travel time tremendously. My brother and I would have to wake up incredibly early just to get ready to leave so we could be at school on time. Then, after school, we'd begin our leisurely trek back home. This went on for a few years until that day happened. My friends had been talking about a new game they had just gotten and had been bragging to me about it for an entire month. I had desperately wanted to play it. So one day after school, my friends invited me over to hang out. As we were leaving, my little brother was tagging along, until one of my friends mentioned not wanting to hang out with a little kid. Telling my little brother to go home on his own is my biggest regret, but it's something I have to live with. My brother didn't argue or protest. He simply said, all right, and we all parted ways. I didn't make it home until late in the evening. I walked in through the front door and tossed my bag on the couch. My mother greeted me and asked me where my brother was. Before I responded, I felt a pit rapidly growing in my stomach. I told her that I went to a friend's house and that he should have been home by now. But he never made it home. The first few days were the roughest. My father beat me relentlessly and my mother never stopped crying. My parents got the entire town involved in the search. After a week of combing through the woods while I was confined to my room, the search turned up nothing. My father began drinking heavily while my mother became a shut-in. Even though my parents were having a rough time, I think I was having the worst of it. The guilt I felt for telling my brother to go home that day ate away at me. I couldn't sleep, eat, or even think about anything, and it never got better. During the first month, my parents refused to give up. My father would drive around the woods every night, and my mother would post flyers around town. I was forbidden to leave my room unless it was to go to school, and only then would my father drop me off and pick me back up. I helped my parents as best I could, even though I could see the resentment in their eyes. They hated me for what I had done. I hated me. But I helped my mother print out flyers. The teachers allowed me to use the copier in the lounge. I used to hate going to school and love staying at home, but now it was the complete opposite. School felt happy and warm. Everyone was so kind to me, even though it was obviously born out of pity, while my home life was broken and cold. After the second month, the efforts began to wane. My mother stopped posting flyers, but my father still committed himself to driving around every other night searching for him. My mom actually started to realize how hard my life had been and began to see that I was suffering as well. She told me she didn't hate me for what had happened, that it was an accident. I know that it was hard for her to say that, but still it made me feel better at least. Six months had passed. Our family was slowly starting to rebuild our lives. My mother even began smiling again. My father still drank, but he did his best not to let it consume him. He still worked full time and kept a roof over our heads. The day my little brother came home, I'll never forget it. I was sitting in class near a window, mindlessly working on a worksheet the teacher had given out. My gaze lazily drifted from my paper to the window, letting my mind wander out of boredom. When I saw him, my brother was standing on the edge of the tree line, 
just staring at the school. Once I realized what I was seeing, I jumped up so fast it sent my desk tumbling forward towards the ground. The crash made my entire class, including my teacher, look up at me. I didn't say a word. I didn't ask permission. I didn't even look at anyone. I just ran out of the classroom, down the hall, and tore through the main doors as fast as I could. During this time, I remember praying that he wasn't just a hallucination. I rounded the nearby perimeter fence of the school and then I saw him. He was standing in the same exact spot as before. I ran into him so hard it almost sent him flying if not for my arms wrapping around him as tight as I could. I looked at him with tears in my eyes, scanning him for any sign of injury. I couldn't come up with any words to say to him other than, I'm sorry. He didn't say anything back, but I just assumed it was because of shock. By that time, my teacher had seen what had happened and phoned the police as well as my parents. My brother was taken to a nearby hospital with my mother in tow. She started crying again, only this time it was tears of joy. He spent an entire week there while the doctors ran numerous tests on him. Though what was odd was that, apart from some minor bruises and a few small cuts, my brother was perfectly fine. Well, fine for someone who had been missing half a year. He wasn't even malnourished or dehydrated at all. Even though on the surface he seemed reasonably alright, underneath, mainly his mind, I could tell something was wrong. My little brother didn't speak for an entire month after we had found him. He would wake up in the morning, eat breakfast, go to his room, and just sit on his bed all day staring out of his window. Everyone just assumed it was PTSD. He had suffered a very traumatic experience. No one could blame him. But to me, something wasn't quite right. I knew he was always quiet, but the way he looked out of the window wasn't the vacant stare of a broken person. It was like he was looking for something. Or someone. I remember the first time he spoke to me. I was sleeping, and around 3 a.m. I was awoken by a sharp poke to my shoulder. My eyes slowly cracked open and I saw my brother standing over me. I asked him if everything was alright. What he said to me sent a shiver down my spine. He said, They are coming, before screaming at the top of his lungs and dashing back to his room. I quickly followed and found him hiding under his bed, shaking. Over the years, his trauma got better. It even got to the point where most people remember something happening in the past, but not much else. My brother slowly recovered and now leads a very normal life. He even has a wife now. I myself am living alone, just trying to get by day by day. Normally, I would let this experience fade from memory, if only to absolve me of my mistake I made all those years ago. But last night, I was awoken by my phone ringing. When I answered it, I heard nothing for a moment before a voice crackled through the receiver. They are here, the voice said. It was my brother. I asked him if everything was alright, but the line abruptly went dead. It's been a full week and nobody has seen my brother or his wife since. Everyone at their work seems to think they just went on a vacation. But I know the truth. He went back to those woods. If you find yourself walking near a forest at night, keep your distance. You never know who or what could be in the darkness, waiting to steal you away.